lovely to be invited to this bell house virtual as it were um and uh i should say hello to an international audience so we have people from i think uh canada and america and dublin and all over the place and orkney even uh, which we probably wouldn't happen have usually in a um, uh, bell house talk in dulwich so just very quickly about myself i'm lev perikian my day job is as an orchestra conductor um, and my other day job is as a writer and i live locally to bell house in dulwich i'm in west norwood which i call west west dulwich just trying to uh, raise my profile a bit um, and this is my book into the tangled bank which is the reason i'm giving this talk and it is a subtitle all books have to have subtitles these days and we decided to go for quite a long one in which our author ventures outdoors to consider the British in nature so that's the, the premise of the book um, so how did this book come to be written to, to to tell you about that I have to go a little bit way back into my childhood and talk about the other book that Jan mentioned which is this one why the birds suddenly disappear about which I hope I will at some point be talking uh, this is the book before Into the Tangle Bank, and that came from the resurgence of my interest in bird watching. Um, having been a very keen uh, birder in my uh, extreme youth as a child, when I was about between the ages of seven and 14, I suppose, um, I grew up in a village in Oxfordshire, a small village, and I was obsessed with uh, birds which mostly, mostly um, took the form of wandering around the garden, trying to see them with my trusted binoculars or around the village or looking at them on the, the bird table. But it also meant that I spent a lot of time looking at this book, which I, if you're of a certain age, you might uh, recognize. It's the Reader's Digest or AA Book of British Birds. And it's a magnificent coffee table specimen. Um, uh, of the kind that was very common in the 60s and 70s. And that was my way into nature. That was uh, through birds. I was aware of other things in the 1970s in Oxfordshire. It was uh, probably, there was more contact with the natural world than um, certainly I've had uh, in London uh, through the natural way of things. Um, but when I moved to London as a music student in the 80s. Um, real life got in the way, I suppose. It took over from my interest in uh, the natural world and I found myself really quite unengaged with nature. Not that I was walking around with a paper bag on my head, but I was, uh, I wouldn't have ever have gone out to a nature reserve or anything. I would have noticed things if they came uh, very close to me. But I was like, I think, like a lot of people. Um, but as I say, as middle age encroached and I got uh, interest, interested in birds again and I picked up that magnificent book and started leafing through it. And it led to the writing of Why Do Birds Suddenly Disappear, which is the story of that return and the reawakening of interest in nature. And in particular of the year 2016, uh, in which I set myself the task of seeing 200 species of British bird, which um, which was one of those things, I suppose it was like a, a, a MacGuffin almost, a, a, a peg you hang a book idea on, but it was also something to keep me interested in the, the task because I was notoriously, to myself, I was a notorious uh, abandoner of projects. So I set myself this task, I'm gonna see these 200 birds, write a book about it. And as I did so, I of course had to go to a lot of nature reserves and around the country quite a lot. And I found myself observing not just the birds, but the people who were looking at the birds. And I found myself almost more fascinated by their behavior than I was by the, the birds. Um, and of course, with that immersion in the, the particular aspect of the natural world came other things that I naturally notice. For example, at this time of year, July and August, um, the, the bird activity is uh, quite low. Uh, they've done their breeding, they're not looking to get a mate, they're not looking to defend their territory. The, the kids have probably flown the nest um, by now, 
And so really what they're doing is the, the adult birds are hunkering down and they're molting and things um, and regaining their energy for the, the autumn and winter. Um, so there are other things to do during July and August, notably butterflies, which are uh, the, the big thing at this time of year, and other insects and bees and all sorts of things. So I became interested in those almost as a byproduct of uh, writing this book uh, about the world of birds, which gave me the idea of writing a not quite sequel, as it were, something that took the, the, where I left off, somebody newly interested in nature, not an expert, not somebody who'd spent their life um, uh, thinking about it or observing it, but somebody who was very strongly infused by it uh, quite late in life. Um, with also the, the other strand of um, the people, the people being part of the natural world. I think too often we see the natural world as something separate from people. It's the humans and then there's the natural world. I could see it as, as uh, something that we are part of and that it's part of us. So it was um, a pretty broad subject and uh, I pitched it to Elliot and Thompson, uh, the, the publishers, and they, they liked it. And so we sat around having you know, decided that I would write this book. We sat around for a while twiddling our thumbs and wondering how, what the best way into it would be to make it something more than just a sort of ramble through nature. Um, and then about two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, I went over the road, just over there, to post a letter. And I'm going to read you a little bit from the introduction that tells you what happened next. I cross the road and my eye is caught by a movement, a fluttering, scattery movement, as of one not quite in control, but going there anyway. As of, in fact, a butterfly. I trace its skeetering path and watch as it settles on a flower looking set for the medium hall. A motionless butterfly is always worth closer examination. In flight, their eye-catching was often frustratingly transient, flitting away on apparently random zigging paths and usually out of my sight within a couple of seconds. But when they settle, it's nice to move in for a closer look. And that's when I lie down on the pavement. Because, you know, why not? I managed to do so, without casting my shadow over it and making it fly away. So far, so good. I inch closer and to hell with my trousers. They can always be washed until I'm no more than two feet from it. It stays put. I feel trust has been established. It is, to my eyes, a thing of transcendent and eye-catching beauty. In flight, a delicate wisp of ultramarine, insubstantial looking, vulnerable to the merest puff of wind, and then settling on a purple flower whose name I don't know, it's transformed, a delicate patchwork of white and black spots on a soft beige background with orange teardrops at the wing edge, the only hint of blue, a silvery tinge at the base of the underwing. Fine, intricate, fascinating. The kind of thing, in fact, you might lie down on a pavement for. I don't know about butterflies, that's a quarter of a lie. I didn't know anything at all about butterflies, cabbage white, and that's it, until the resurgence of my interest in bird watching a few years ago. A scant grasp of butterfly identification came along with it, almost as collateral. Birds go quiet in July and August, just when butterflies are at their peak, so it's a natural progression. Now, I can recognise a few species almost unfailingly. Brimstone, orange tip, comma, peacock, speckled wood, meadow brown, and some with a bit of help from a field guide as long as they stick nice and still, which they don't. But whole swathes of them remain mysterious, especially those orange and black masters of disguise, the fritillary family, damn their fluttery wings. This one, though, I know. It's a common blue, or, so my field guide tells me, Polyomatus icarus, the male of the species. Widespread in the British Isles, in flight from May to September. That word, common, doesn't do it justice. It dismisses it as something nondescript, unimportant, not really worthy of attention. But here it is in front of me, transfixing me with its delicate charms. I become aware of a movement and look up. A small girl, four or five, 
running up the hill towards me. Behind her, a man, presumably her father, making slower progress. Phone out, head down, obviously trusting to peripheral vision that everything's fine and that his daughter's not going to die a grisly death under the wheels of a truck. The girl stops a few feet away from me, perplexed. And now the man looks up from the screen, takes in the situation and calls across, at the same time veering away from me to turn the corner. He beckons to her. Come on, Poppet. I can't blame him. A middle-aged man lying on the pavement is very much the kind of thing you might want to keep your daughter away from. But it seems a shame. What I really want to do is call over, summon both of them across so they can share this everyday miracle, the casual and phenomenal beauty of a common thing so easily overlooked. Look at this. Isn't it beautiful? It overtakes me sometimes, this urge to share. There's nobody quite so zealous as the recent convert, after all. At times, I find myself fired with an almost embarrassing missionary zeal, infused by a mundane and passing spectacle. I see a feral pigeon execute a particularly impressive landing, or a silver birch with finely coiled, peeling bark, or a dragonfly just being a dragonfly. And part of me wants to yell, look at this, everyone, look at this. But no matter how enthralled I am by the butterfly, I'm also aware of how strange I must look. So I stay silent, restrained by a self-consciousness of which I'm slightly ashamed. And off they go. The girl, pleasingly old-fashioned, skipping along the pavement. The man, inevitably modern, buried once more in his phone. After a few seconds, the butterfly flits off anyway, and I go home for a coffee. And it's only an hour later that I realise I forgot to post the letter. So that was the initial encounter that gave me the idea of it being this book being a journey from my front door and going outwards to wherever uh, looking at my local patch um, and obviously looking at the people because the the three of us the me the man and his daughter seem to me to represent the different points on the the spectrum of nature engagement so there was me at one end completely enthusiastic with him at the other um, oblivious to the whole thing and the girl who's a, a blank slate, if you like, who didn't know if she was curious or not yet, and she could have turned into anything. Um, and of course, everybody is somewhere on that spectrum, from the mildly interested to the fully expert. Um, and I just thought if I go out um, to as many places as possible, I'll encounter loads of people and I can, uh, I can write about those encounters. So it's about those people, it's about my journey, but to give the journey a bit more structure and direction that might otherwise have been, I suppose, lacking, uh, just kind of randomly going out, I thought it would be nice to give the whole journey some context and also some stopping off points by looking at the lives and the works of some of the people, some of the great and the good, if you like, of the natural history world people who devoted their lives to the natural world and to observing it and to expressing their love for it in various different ways. Um, and I'll talk about, a little bit about a couple of them in a bit. Um, so the, the beginning of the book, it starts, as I say, in, in the home and the garden and on my own patch. And of course, in the last three or four months, that aspect of the book has become particularly relevant even though it was written you know, before uh, COVID-19 and before lockdown without any idea of it. Um, and I've been really struck, I was very struck, especially at the, the beginning of lockdown by the number of people knowing of my particular interest in birdsong who uh, would email me or tweet me or contact me some, in some way or other or on a Zoom call would say, have you, have you noticed? Have you noticed how loud the bird song is? Um, it seems to be much louder than in previous years. And uh, to which I'm afraid my answer was usually, well, it isn't, I don't think. Uh, it's just that everything else is quieter and that you're noticing it more because maybe you're at home or maybe there's less traffic or you've now got a bit of time to think about these things. Um, so I found that fascinating because it's something I've been noticing for the last few years at the very least, 
And of course, lockdown coincided with the burgeoning of spring around uh, March and April, as the bird song was getting more intense and intensifying um, quite naturally anyway. So uh, it's, I find it um, kind of uh, ironic and funny or interesting that the part of the book that I um, started writing in the very beginning has suddenly become uh, more pertinent simply because of circumstances um, out of our control, out of my control, certainly. Um, I'm going to do a, a, a short reading from the uh, passage about my, my local patch. And this in its own way is pertinent to um, particularly this week because it's about pretty much my favorite bird, um, the swifts. And if you're uh, interested in birds, you'll probably know that they've been around for three months. They've flown from Africa arriving in early May and they're just about leaving now. I saw ours, the ones that fly around and have nested next door. Um, I saw them, I think, for the last time yesterday, and they've gone off. Uh, their very short season is now over. So this is a, a little bit about um, my coming to observations of a local patch, and in particular, with the Swifts. 7th of May, 2019. I've been twitchy all week, hoping they might somehow come back a couple of days early, but knowing from previous years that they're not due yet. There's a nervousness too. What if they don't make it? Numbers countrywide are down. Something to do with weather systems in Southern Europe, maybe. Something to do with a general decline in recent years. Something to do with ecological collapse. But ours will make it. They have to. They do. Some years, they announce themselves with a scream and a flyby and an exuberance entirely out of keeping with the distance they've travelled. If I had just flown in from Africa, I'd barely have the energy to dump my bags in the hall before flummocking on the sofa for a week. But then I have the luxury of a freezer full of food and, should the need arise, a takeaway menu. The struggle for survival is rather more claw to beak for birds. This year, their arrival is more discreet and I see them only because I'm looking for them. And I mean really looking, with the kind of attention that nearly gets me run over by an incredulous gesticulating cyclist as I cross the road at the bottom of the hill. And here they are, wriggling punctuation marks high over the house. Why swifts? Why not swallows, house martins, sand martins, nightingales, red starts, chiff chaffs, willow warblers, white throats, black caps, and any of the other birds that make a similar, equally hazardous journey every year? They're all great too, obviously. But swifts have something about them. That sickle shape, their astonishing speed, the brevity of their stay in this country, all contributing to my blind, unrequited love for them, my desire to stand outside the back door, looking gormlessly upwards, drinking in their every appearance. Perhaps it's their mastery of the air, the sheer audacity of their aerobatics, the impression they give with their high-pitched squeals that they're having enormous fun. They are more even than kestrels and albatrosses and hummingbirds, the embodiment of flight. They th fly the way I'd like to, if I had the ability, fast and free and screaming with the thrill of it all. Swifts abhor the ground to the extent that if they land on it, they need a helping hand to get up again. And when not sitting on eggs, they spend the majority of their lives in the air. Not like those lightweights, the swallows with all their perching and whatnot. I started noting the date of the Swift's return a few years ago, and it proved the beginning of what, for want of a better word, I call a nature diary. It's a haphazard, woefully inconsistent mishmash of notes and photos and question marks and incomplete lists that would horrify any true naturalist, but it is still, in its own way, a nature diary. From it, I know that on the 3rd of October 2015, I was excited by a blackbird singing from the top of next door's tree, that on the 14th of April 2018, I saw the first orange tip butterfly of the year in West Norwood Cemetery, and that every year for the last six years, the Swifts have arrived on either the 6th or the 7th of May. They're nothing if not consistent. From it, I also know that I have a tendency to forget about my nature diary for about three months every July. Twas ever thus. 
Sometimes my entries comprise nothing more than a list of birds seen, a dull, efficient way of keeping records, but sadly lacking in the fond memories department. Sometimes the shortest of notes evokes a particular image, and I can remember the occasion clearly, blue tit on bathroom ledge, or, even more memorably, magpie in the kitchen. And when I read the words, buggy mummies, swans, I remember the warm day in March 2017, when, while admiring two mute swans preparing their pitch for the season's nest in Crystal Palace Park, I heard a young mother say to her friend, oh look, the swans are making a nest. I suppose they'll be laying eggs soon. Do swans lay eggs? I should know this. These records play their part in the gradual accrual of familiarity with my patch. But if my efforts to get to know it have been earnest and sincere, and if I'm beginning to recognise subtleties, changes and patterns, can tell you which birds are most likely to be found doing what and where and when, and if I've started to identify butterflies, trees, flowers, and even the occasional bee, then these efforts can only be considered paltry when placed alongside the man whose observations of his patch led to him being known as the father of ecology. And at this point in a reading, I'd usually say, and if you want to know who the father of ecology was, you have to buy the book. Um, but I'll tell you, because you're here, it's Gilbert White, of course, um, who was my, my next visit, and to whose observations and his life, um, lifetime spent looking at his local patch in Selborne in Hampshire, I compare my own poultry events. So White was um, uh, possibly the, well, the father of ecology. He was also the father of ornithology. His observations on various birds um, on his patch uh, were uh, quite important in establishing some of the, the, um, the differences between them. Um, he mastered, I think, the art of what I talked about in that little short reading, uh, the art of not just looking, but really looking. And if you read his copious um, writings from his garden calendar to his diaries or his, um, his letters, which is the, the main thing that he's known for, the natural history of Selborne, which is a collection of letters from him to various other naturalists, some of which were real letters and others of which were uh, kind of made up for the book as it were. Um, if you read that, you see that he's not just making lists of things and um, saying, I saw this and I saw that and I saw the other and I saw this. He, although he does do that, and some of it just takes the form of notes, you know, of, of interesting things. But he's joining the dots in a way that uh, not many people had done before. He's putting things together, noticing the patterns of uh, annual things, um, which, which things are early and which things are late and which things seem to be connected. Um, all sorts of stuff that um, I think we now take for granted as, uh, as uh, in, the, in the world of nature watching or nature recording. But he was really one of the first people to do it. Um, Charles Darwin, of course, was a, a big fan of his and he um, took inspiration from his works and I also visited Darwin's place um, and both of uh, both of those uh, people Darwin and White uh, were uh, rigorous recorders of things in words by writing down whether it's uh, books or uh, nature diaries or calendar or, or whatever but of course there are other ways of uh, expressing your love for the natural world and I became interested in the, the illustrations in particular of Thomas Buick, who while Gilbert White was putting the finishing touches to his natural history of Selborne, um, Buick was embarking on the other side of the country in Northumberland on his masterworks, um, the natural history of quadrupeds and uh, Buick's British birds, um, which brought to many people uh, their first uh, visual encounters with wildlife that they would never have uh, seen before. Um, and Guick, uh, like all of these naturalists, was immersed uh, in the natural world from his childhood. Um, but his particular way of expressing it by drawing and the wood engraving, which was the, his speciality and which he brought an extraordinary vividness to and new levels of skill, 
to an art form that seemed at the time to have hit the plateau. Um, that really uh, uh, paved the way for, for other wildlife artists. Um, and art, because I'm a, a writer and a musician, um, is something that I've always been interested in. Uh, I'll say something about this in the, in the, in the reading. It's something that I can't do. Um, and therefore I've actually been more fascinated by it. Um, because I think the things that I can more or less do, like music and, and words, are I think I know, uh, I know what writers are doing, I know what musicians are doing, I know what composers are doing, I know their skill sets and their tricks. Um, but when I look at a work of art, by pretty much anybody of any competence, I'd sit there slack jawed and go, and how did you do that? Anyway, I thought at this late stage in my life, in my 50s, it might be a good idea to try. Not trusting a live bird to sit still long enough for my purpose, I go to my photo collection. Soon enough, a suitable candidate presents itself. A heron, standing in beaky isolation against a backdrop of reeds. Should be simple enough. Herons are non-chrome birds, well suited to pencil sketching, and they have a distinctive shape, recognisable to even the most casual park visitor. Pointy dagger beak, round eye, scraggly shawl. That should do it. It doesn't. In my version, the bill is unequivocally the wrong shape. The head is more like a donkey's, and is somehow hanging from the body in a way that makes it look as if the bird is halfway through being beheaded. And quite what a heron is doing wearing a toupee is anyone's guess. It looks like a heron drawn by someone who has heard a five second description of a heron in a language they don't speak by someone who once met a guy who heard about a heron that visited their grandmother's hometown 50 years ago. I try to fix it, changing a line here, adding one there, rubbing out the toupee and drawing a crest. Now it just looks like a heron that has been drawn by a heron. Drawing is every bit as hard as I thought. I look again at the photograph. It's a lovely one. The bird's profile, strong against a blurry background and with nothing intervening to complicate matters. Why is it so hard? I abandon the drawing and try again. My second effort looks like the work of a bright six-year-old. I call that progress of sorts and, undaunted, have one more go. And it's only now that I realise the basic error of my ways. I've never looked at a heron. Not properly. I've looked at them many times, both with the naked eye and through binoculars. I recognise the shape instantly, whether it's standing with infinite patience in the local park, flying overhead with those slow lapping wing beats and distinctive bulgy neck, head back between its shoulder blades, or, as on one memorable occasion, landing on our shed roof, scrabbling against the unexpected camber, then flying away with an aggrieved bra. I know what a heron looks like. But at the same time, I realise, I don't know what a heron looks like. There's a difference between recognising something and knowing how it's put together. It's the difference between being able to order paella y dos cervezas, por favor, and actually holding a conversation in Spanish. I spend a few minutes examining the photograph, taking in the precise angle of the tip of the bill, the rate at which it thickens towards the head, the precise configuration of its base, how that relates to the elongated nostril on the top, the eye, the near the front of the head, level with the top half of the bill, has a thin black ring surrounding it. And then there's a thick black stripe sweeping back, dominating the top of the head, thinning out a bit and topped with a few wispy streaks of feather which form a perky little crest. This realisation is one thing. Making my hand reproduce it is quite another. I make a tentative line, the top of the bill. It wobbles. I try again, willing myself to be more confident. Now it's too long, too heavy. Third time lucky. Bingo. And now the bottom of the bill, being careful, but not too careful to get the angle right. I build the basic outline of the bird, referring back to the photograph time and time again to check my progress, and eventually I lay down the pencil. It's as good as I can make it. It's finished. Maybe just another line here. No, leave it be. You'll ruin it. But no. It's the easiest mistake to make, fiddling for fiddling's sake, thinking that the next little amendment will be the thing that transforms it. 
And in fact, you might have been better off getting it right in the first place. I look at my heron. At the very least, it resembles something its mother might recognise, so I'm taking that as a whim. It's not just the sense of achievement that gives me a boost. There's something more. I realised that while I was drawing this heron, my mind was occupied with one thing only, drawing the heron. Whether you call it mindfulness or meditation or just concentration, that focus, the single-minded devotion of one's energies to completing a task, feels like a healthy thing. Throw in the strangely relaxing physical sensation of making the marks, the smooth sweep of drawing a curved line, the staccato tapping when doing the speckly bits, the obscure pleasure gained from filling in the eye with little circular movements until there remains the tiniest speck of white, the life-giving gleam of it, and you have pure therapy. And I've ignored it for nearly five decades. What a pillock. So, um, that, I think, uh, comes back again to what I was talking about with, um, with Gilbert White, the, the, the art of looking. Um, and of course, the, the visual way of engaging in the, representing nature developed with the advent of photography. And I, um, just in case you were thinking it was going to be all about men, I do introduce at this point uh, the great uh, botanist and pioneer photographer, Anna Atkins, whose early cyanotypes of algae were, um, well, they, they, again, they paved the way for what we now know um, as uh, photography. Um, and then jumping forward a little bit, uh, I was particularly taken by the story of Emma Turner, who was a pioneering nature photographer and the, the first warden of National Trust's um, Skull Head in North Norfolk. Um, uh, both these people, and like all the others, um, immersed themselves in nature. Emma Turner was ast astonishing. She would bury herself in, in uh, vegetation for hours upon end to get the perfect photograph of uh, whatever it might be, a snipe or something, or a bittern, which is her most famous photograph. Um, so there is that uh, wholehearted immersion. And I came across many people, both on my journey and in my researches, uh, who were prepared to do that. But nowadays, I wonder whether um, with the technology that we have to bring nature into our homes in such a vivid way, whether our interaction with it is a little bit more passive, which brings me to my next little video. The iguana stands still, alert, its head flicking briefly to the left, eye unblinking. Something's up. You can tell by the music. Racer snakes, slim and long and writhy, quite a few of them sliding across the sand in search of prey. The iguana must stand completely motionless and hope the snakes don't see it. They see it. With a strange prancing gait and to a soundtrack that wouldn't be out of place in Game of Thrones, it's off, the snakes in close pursuit. You can keep the French connection. Speed was lightweight in comparison. If you want the thrill of the chase, look to the modern nature documentary. Pounding drums and scurrying strings accompany the iguana on its fearful journey away from danger. The snakes, sinister killing machines, are the bad guys. The iguana, pucky, resourceful, fighting overwhelming odds, is the hero. The snakes get closer, gaining on the iguana, inexorably closing the gap. Even as a hatchling recently emerged from its sandy birthplace, it can outstrip the snakes on the flat, but it's run straight into an ambush. More snakes await, and now they have it in their grasp, enveloping it in their slithering embrace. There are five, six of them. It's difficult to tell with all arriving. The iguana struggles briefly, then seems to accept the inevitable. The jig surely is up. But no. With a monumental effort, it wrenches itself free and bounds away from the despairing lunges of the snakes up the rocks, it leaps across a gap beyond their reach to its parents and safety. The snakes must find another meal. In the alternative narrative, the snakes are the main protagonists, driven by hunger and trying to take advantage of a rare feeding opportunity, ingeniously pooling their resources and working as a team to find and secure the food necessary for their survival. But we prefer iguanas to snakes, so the filmmakers choose this version. On a sofa in South London, we watch transfixed. The tension is almost unbearable. As the snakes exert their stranglehold, I let out a tortured <laughs> and then, finding my voice, run, Iggy, run, run, run fast, they're going to kill you. Finally, 
As the scene comes to a close, the music relaxes its grip and the narrative shifts to the charming habits of the snares penguin, accompanied by appropriately winsome and playful music, naturally, we can breathe a little more easily. Nature programmes weren't always like this. Gone, apparently, are the days of David Attenborough standing next to an armadillo, genially explaining its sex life. These flagship BBC programmes, Planet Earth, The Blue Planet and so on, are high on budget, high on production values, and also, dare I suggest, very slightly high on their own brilliance. I applaud them for the sheer dedication and skill required to capture these images, for bringing the astonishing richness of the natural world so vividly into my Sunday evening. I also worry that while entertaining and educating us, they unconsciously raise our expectations. Nature, in our daily experience of it, will never be this cinematic. And while it's important and amazing to be shown the glories and grandeur of natural phenomena of all kinds from all over the world, there's a danger that the definition of nature lover becomes one who loves nature programmes. No matter how immersive and gripping these programmes are, they're no substitute for getting out into the pissing rain in the vain expectation that the drab mudflat before you will yield something more dramatic than the distant and bedraggled shell dog. I realise I might not be selling the real life nature experience in the most effective way. Let me have another go. I'll try to do it without sounding too earnestly evangelical. If we are part of nature and it is part of us, we are and it is, then it follows that any disconnection from it means a disconnection from ourselves. This doesn't mean we all have to stalk the local common with a pair of binoculars marvelling at every blade of grass, and it absolutely isn't to dismiss the importance and value of good nature programmes. As should be clear from the passage above, I love them as much as the next sofa turnip. But we should also beware of mistaking them for the real thing. They show us what are commonly thought of as the best bits, the drama, the action, the pitting of often spectacular and exotic creatures against each other or the elements. And having seen a pod of orcas take out a seal in the frothing spume in crystal clear high definition super slow-mo, when we venture out into the real world, the bedraggled shell duck might come as something of a disappointment. But sometimes the best bits aren't dramatic at all. They can be found in the simplest and nothingest of things, the aforementioned blade of grass, if you like, or the chaotic tangle of a bramble in autumn heavy with fruit ripe for the plucking, or that particular sensation you get when the wind picks up a fraction on a not quite warm enough spring day and brings a chill to your cheek in a way that reminds you what it is to be alive, or simply the undervalued pleasure of sitting on a bench and doing nothing, looking at nothing, just allowing everything, including yourself, to get on with the underrated, underrated business of existing. So, Having established that idea that actually the, it's the doing nothing um, that can be the best part of it, or certainly is, plays a large part in it. Uh, I remember when I first went back to bird watching, I was realizing how much of my time out bird watching was spent not actually seeing any birds, but that was all part of the pleasure. I then have to admit that I do seek out quite a lot of excitement and adventure as, I, as my journey becomes wilder and goes to farther flung places. Um, I find myself yearning for the, those spectacles and going out on uh, boat trips to see white-tailed eagles, going to the Farn Islands to be pecked by Arctic terns and the sightings of bottom-nosed dolphins, and uh, going on a, a, a special journey or specialist journey to see a beluga whale that turned up briefly in the Thames uh, at the end of two years ago. Um, but of all the experiences, I think is uh, the one that I enjoyed the most and remember the most well, is the week I spent on a small island off Pembrokeshire called Skokum, which is a bird observatory it was Britain's first bird observatory, founded by uh, Ronald Lockley in 1933. And its uh, population is approximately 200,000. Uh, 200,000 of which are seabirds, and at most 26 of which are humans. So there are two wardens who live there from February through to October or November. And they undergo very important scientific work. Um, monitoring the seabird population there and observing all the, the nature there. 
uh, in a very rigorous way uh, that I can't compete with. Um, and uh, that's been going on for 90 years and it builds up an incredible record of uh, the patterns and shapes of the fluctuating populations and a very important record of the, the way these things uh, fluctuate and in some cases go down. Uh, they have some long-term volunteers who uh, live there as well, who help them with their work. And you can also pay and go and stay there for a week, uh, which is exactly what I did uh, last end of last August. Um, so this is a short bit about some of that. I'm 54 years old and I've never held a storm petrol. What the hell have I been doing with my life? In my defence, opportunities for close contact with this magical and mysterious bird have been few. I have lived my life inland, mostly in cities. The storm petrel, otherwise known as Mother Carey's chicken, lives almost exclusively at sea. Our trajectories have never coincided. Until now. Richard has brought the petrel up from the harbour to be ringed, and now Giselle is holding it. It's calm, unblinking in the red light of our head torches submitting without panic to the brief ordeal of ringing before it's released back into the night. From the harbour below comes the recorded sound of storm petrol song, played to lure them in. I say song. It's an evocative sound, described by naturalist Charles Oldham as like a fairy being sick. The purring part of it sounds to me like a Geiger canter, and it's capped off with occasional scrurks or shirkers or just outright squawks. So maybe song isn't the most intuitive word to use. Giselle supervises as Will carries out the ringing, patiently crimping the tiny metal band around the bird's leg with specialised pliers, making sure it's in no danger of causing the bird injury or discomfort. When they're both satisfied the job's been done properly, she turns to me. Do you want to release it? Yes. And no. I'm a muggle in bird ringing terms. This is proper scientific work carried out by proper scientific people. Giselle and Richard are the wardens, Will a long-term volunteer. Between them, they have ringed more birds than I've eaten bowls of grape nuts. Me, I'm a bystander, here for the Scopum experience, drawn by the remoteness, the isolation and the birds. My main priority so far has been to get as close to the action as I can without disrupting it. And now I'm being invited to hold a life in my hands. For a moment, I feel the incipient horror of getting it wrong, of somehow in my nervous, eager clumsiness, destroying this tiny, fragile thing. But I also really, really want to do it. Yeah, okay. It's all casual-like. She gives me the petrol. I cradle it gently in cupped hands, desperate not to squeeze too tight, but equally keen not to let it fly away before I'm told. It fits snugly in my palms, even smaller than I'd expected. It is warm and soft, still, trusting. There's no flapping, no scrabbling to get away. Unexpectedly, it smells a distinctive, pleasant, musky scent. If you had to choose a seabird for this first bird-in-the-hand experience, the storm petrel would be as good a choice as any. Gulls are feisty, and the bigger ones do a nice line in beak jabbing. Gannets, by turns elegant and thrilling on the water, could have your eye out in a trice. Fulmers, larger cousins of storm petrels in the tube nose family, vomit a foul-smelling oily gunk all over you that stays on you for days. I'll take the storm petrel, thanks. We walk a, a few yards down the hill towards the harbour, cross the path to the low wall. Giselle tells me exactly what I'm going to do. Place the bird on the wall, keeping my hands around it, then opening them in a V-shape, encouraging it to take the righteous path towards the edge and freedom. It might fly straight away, or it might tarry a while. In any case, what we don't want is for it to come back path side. Not that it would be disastrous, just inconvenient for Giselle and embarrassing for me. I follow her instructions. The petrel sits on the wall, apparently happy to chill there till breakfast. And then it's gone, plopped off onto the ground just the other side of the wall. And then I hear the tiniest flurry as it flies off into the darkness. I pause for a second then turn to Giselle, keen to thank her for this lifetime experience. Before I can say anything, there's a voice from a few yards up the hill. Giselle? Alice, one of the other long-term volunteers, has something. 
Yes? There's a bank of sheer water on the wall. Of course there is. Giselle turns, her head torch picking out a dark shape. Plump, squat, beaky. It looks up at us, unmoving. Correct. Welcome to Skoken. So that is where the journey ends. Well, it's not quite, because there's one more chapter after that. But seriously, if you want to know what that is, then you really do have to buy the book. Um, that's the end of my talk, which I hope hasn't outstayed its welcome, the readings. Um, and Absolutely I wonder if there are not. any questions. Yes, thank you, Lev. I thought that was wonderful. Um, there are some questions, we'll just go through them in a minute. Um, I have to say it resonated with me what you said about birdsong being louder yeah. in conversations. I had a few of those conversations as well. It's just no, no it isn't. <laughs> How do they know? <laughs> the trouble is, by, by saying that, I came across as a bit of a know-it-all, but there's, you know, you have to say, well, no, wel welcome to my world. And I was welcome to the world a few years ago when I came back by the people who had been there in turn for, for years. Yeah. So, um, you know, no, yeah. it's, it's, it's just un unlikely, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go to questions. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And if you do have any more, please pop them in the chat box now. Um, let's start with Edwin. Thank uh, Edwin, all the way from Nashville. Excellent. Um, so Edwin's asked a couple, so I'll, I'll start with him and then come back to him later. He says, do you know if butterflies will land on humans to get moisture from human sweat? Um, he's asking because he had this butterfly who landed on his arm multiple times when he was in, in the garden at Andrew Jackson's home. Interesting. I, this, see, the, here's, this is the trouble because I think I said at the beginning, I'm not an expert. Um, <laughs> so I, I wonder if they do. I've had butterflies land on me and I've never quite been certain whether it's just out of tiredness, uh, maybe they're towards the end of their life cycle and, they're, and they are just lack the energy to do anything else. I do know that if you put a bee, uh, you know, get a bit of sugar solution um, and put a bee on it, it will perk up um, you know, no end. And so I, I would assume that butterflies are the same, but I mean, it might depend on the composition of your sweat. Um, but so we yeah we've had we've had gardens uh, gardens in the butterfly we've had butterflies in the garden <laughs> and they sometimes are uh, allow you to get very close um, and I did have one uh, earlier this year an orange tip a beautiful thing which just was quite happy to be on my hand um, but I think people who have spent more time in their lives with butterflies might be better placed to answer that question sorry that's a cop out no no not at all well interestingly we are actually planning a butterfly talk pin a uh, date to pin pin down but um that is something that's in the pipeline brilliant yes well, um, I'm, I'm so please good. please do look out for that yeah um okay so thank you um nisha i hope that's how you pronounce it uh well these lovely irish names um please can you tell me a bit more about swifts um needing help to take flight Oh, yes, there's a fantastic article about Swifts uh, in the New Yorker, and it's online uh, this week by Helen McDonald, who wrote H is for Hall. It's a, I thoroughly recommend it. What it doesn't do is tell you about um, them needing to take flight. So Swifts, um, this is something I do know a bit about. They have, uh, uh, they spend nearly all their lives in the air. They're made for the air. They do have feet. Their scientific name is Apus Apus, which is the Greek for no foot, no foot because scientists thought uh, when they were naming them back in the 18th century they thought they spent so much time in the air and they never seemed to land that they can't they can't have feet and they do when they did find them they would uh, have difficulty in taking off um, and this is this is the way they've evolved they are the masters of flight they do have feet um, and i do i've discovered a, a mistake in my book which is terrible recently okay. I that thing about uh, I've, I have a footnote um, which has them with, it says that their, their their toes all point forward all four of them it's not the case they they did this when they discovered dead specimens uh, and that's the formation they take when they're dead they actually have two forward and two back for touching but they do then they don't really clutch at all they kind of sit there and and uh, uh, very helpless. So the, the approved method, I understand, and actually uh, taking care of a grounded swift is, uh, is a specialist job. Um, there's a swift rescue, swift conservation, who have a whole uh, website about it. Mm. Um, the thing you mustn't do is throw them in the air. 
because if they're not able to fly, they will just land. The, the idea is that you give them somewhere where they can, if they are able to, and if they want to, uh, that they can take flight from your hand, but you don't force them to do it. Um, and, and the idea of, um, the idea of uh, taking care of it, if you find a Swift, which we won't probably this year anymore, but if you do find a Swift and it's either a fledgling, the thing to do is to call the Swift conservation people. They've got a website. Right. Um, and they will take it into care because it's it's rather um, it, it's rather a specialised thing and not the same as taking care of other birds because of the special yeah, yeah. and their wings are unbelievably strong. Mel, Melissa Harrison tweeted the other day something ridiculous like if we were if humans uh, had wings that were strong enough to propel us in the way that swifts do we they would be 500 meters wide or something ridiculous. Mm, they're incredibly wow. powerful and if the, if you ever have them flying low over you you can hear the the you know the the whoosh of the displaced air so mm. i could go on all night but i should <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for that and thank you yeah, for your best. question um just going back to edwin so he wants to pick up on what you said about the herons um, I recently oh, yeah. heard David Sibley say that the heron is one of the most difficult birds to draw. He said up close it's almost reptilian in nature, like a dinosaur. Yes. Well, that's, well, in America you have fantastic herons. You have the great blue heron that we don't have here and you have all sorts of egrets and, and things. We have the, the grey heron, which is the, the one uh, that I was drawing. Uh, we also have two egrets, with, both of which are white, which are or actually three species that are beginning to come in. And we have the bittern, which is um, an extraordinary sort of tubular thing. And they are, I, well, I'm so glad that somebody's uh, expert as Sibley has, um, has talked about how difficult they are, because I found it impossible. Mm -hmm. um, the, that reptilian thing is absolutely true. I can't think of another bird that immediately reminds you of the birds relationship to dinosaurs in quite oh. the same way they have that pterodactyl air um when they're especially in flight i think and mm -hmm. the sound if you ever hear a heron making sound they don't often do it but they do give that call it's a real sound of the of primordial soup if you like what we imagine <laughs> you know what we imagine it to have been like millions of years ago that rah, something raw and, and very very old oh, so, wow. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, it's gr it's one of my favourite birds. Partly because they're, they're very kind of common and they do stand still for a long time, so you can observe them. Um, and they're very patient. And if you've ever seen a heron uh, eating a fish whole, then that's quite a sight as well. Mm. I'll go into no further details for the squeamish. <laughs> I have to look out for them in uh, Crystal Palace Park because there are a couple there. Yeah. I've never seen them in flight though, I have to say. Um, no, yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Elizabeth is asking, so nature is medicine. Do you think lockdown will change thinking on the sort of government and medical profession since it has been a big tonic for so many during this tough time? Oh God, I hope so. I agree with too. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, I hope so. Otherwise, we're a bit stuffed, really. Um, because if... Yeah, if we don't take care of it now, then, then uh, yeah, under these circumstances, then, then when are we ever going to? Mm. Um, and I do worry. I mean, this isn't a serious book. It has kind of some serious stuff in it. But I've tried not to make it an earnest kind of hand-wringing um, tracked on the state of nature, partly because I'm not sure that that's uh, uh, constructive in a way. The, the, if I have a role in this whole thing, then I want to get people on board, normal people on board, by being a normal-ish person who's come to nature late in life and by just being really, really enthusiastic about it. Um, mm. and, and not being, and I think not being an expert um is is kind of my shtick if you like yeah. um there are great experts who have written great books about um the state of nature mark cocker's our place last two years ago was it last year is is a masterpiece um uh isabella trees wilding of course is uh, is a very important book and, and many things like that yeah 
Um, but and the, all I can do is just say I hope that people understand it. And I think we, this whole thing of the, the, the beasts in our home is very important. We saw our local patch and the mundanity of them and the, the fact that we live with us. I mean, we had flying ant day the other week. And um, yes. yeah, no, and yes, of course they're itchy. But the trouble is that we can't. The, for a lot of people, the first reaction is kill them. And we surely we have to be able to put up with some inconvenience one day in the year if we understand what it is they're doing. You know what? Why they're all suddenly taking flight? It's part of their uh, mm. their breeding cycle and, and and how they how they disperse to 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 further off places rather than the localization of the, their nest so they don't overcrowd. So it's a, it's a way of, of their, you know, procreating. And um, people just, we just see it's an edgy thing and let's kill it. And we've done that with too much and we kind of have to stop, I think. Yes. Uh, we just, we just got one more um, from Jason. Thank you, Jason. Um, okay. There seems to be just sort of about the particular nature books. There seems to be an explosion of nature books recently, particularly on birds and bees. Are you happy with the competition? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't regard it as competition. I, there's, um, I, so if there weren't an explosion of nature books, my books wouldn't be published probably. Um, I have learned what I've learned. I've learned from other nature books, um, birds and bees. Yeah, well, Dave, Dave Goulson's written some fantastic books about bees, and he writes in a particularly engaging and humorous way. And he's a proper expert on bees. Um, I know Bridget Strawbridge Howard's got one out, which is on the Wainwright list this year. So you know, I think it's 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 a crowded field at the moment. I think it has been for a few years now, but I don't think it's an overcrowded field. Um, and I'd like to think um, that uh, the way I write about nature is uh, slightly different from a lot of the, the excellent, I mean, really excellent nature writing that I've read in the last few years. Um, I, th I think there are more jokes in my books than most people's. <laughs> um, I was very pleased, early reviews by the one, the single word Bryson-esque. So if, you know, if it can help to, to broaden the, the, the interest uh, mm. and, and not pe put people off. I mean, the aim was always to make it as welcoming as possible to as many people as possible. So I hope that um, that comes across in the extracts I've read. So no, bring it on. I'll take on a lot of them. I'll have them all. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and just very quickly before we go back to Jan, um, can you tell people how they can get hold of your book? You can go to anywhere that sells books. Um, I happen to know that in Crystal Palace, bookseller Crow, if you're a South Londoner, they have, uh, well, they did have at least a dozen signed copies. Um, I went up there the other day. Uh, the, it's, if you go to my website, um, which I'm going to put in the chat, if that's okay. Please do. Uh, so go to levparikian.com. Um, there are links there. Oh no, that's to Geraldine privately. Hold on, send chat to everyone. <laughs> um, so it. if you go to thebrickin.com, uh, then there are links to Waterstones and Hive. If you're in America, I know that some of these places will ship to America, and it's not too expensive. It's not yet available uh, in, in an American edition, but if we sell thousands and thousands, then no doubt it will be. So yes. um, please, everybody, go out and buy it and. Um, spread the word mm. thank you so much Lev that was that was Thanks. wonderful hope everyone enjoyed it from all corners of the world um Jan back to you yeah okay well I want to say thank you very much Lev for a really interesting talk I so enjoyed it um and um and learned asking. As well, which was really good so um just for everyone who uh managed to find their way in thank you very much for coming um if you're not signed up to the Bell House events, please go to Bell House and do that because there are several more coming. And we are hoping to invite those back again because he's got your paperback book coming out on birds uh, sometime early next year. Is that right, Lev? February next year. Why do birds suddenly disappear out in paperback February yeah. next year? So if you enjoyed this, um, with a bit of luck, Lev will be back again, maybe actually in situ rather than online. That would be fun, right. wouldn't it? We, uh, we, we that would be fun. Oh, I forgot what that's like.